In the late 1980s, Manhattan's Lower East Side was known as an easy place to score drugs and sex. Prostitutes worked right in the open, turning $20 tricks for quick drug money along certain streets known as strolls. The stroll is where prostitutes ply their trade, where they're known to congregate, and the Johns can find them and uh, do their business and get picked up. But one of those Johns was after more than cheap sex. He was out for blood. Tragedy happens in lives. Unfortunately, it was their lives. The world wouldn't know his name until after his killing spree had ended. Now, in a rare prison interview, serial killer Joel Rifkin talks about his sickening crimes down to the smallest detail. And I remember while I was strangling in the truck, she had boots on. She was kicking the uh, driver's side door during this whole thing. Over a four-year period, the sadistic killer patronized hundreds of New York City prostitutes. He strangled 17 of them with his bare hands. Why those 17 beats me? He discarded their bodies in remote areas or dumped them into local rivers. Some he dismembered. Cutting up a body, yeah, it's grotesque and repugnant to most people, but it's at a level less than the actual killing. No one knew about his cold-blooded killing spree. Not the police, not the press, not the public, not even the prostitutes themselves. People in that environment almost go virtually unreported and uh, slip through the cracks. 22-year-old Tiffany Bresciani was his last victim. She was just very happy and beautiful and loved people. Tiffany had moved from Louisiana to New York to become an actress or a dancer. But instead of finding Broadway's bright lights, the city's dark side got her first. To support a drug addiction, she turned to prostitution. I still have that heartache, you know, it never goes away. There's that empty feeling sometimes, you know, without her. In spite of her troubles, Tiffany remained in close touch with her mother. But in June of 1993, she stopped calling home. She'd call about three times a week, you know. We really kept in touch that week that it happened. I said, did she call yet? And I had the most awful feeling. What happened to Tiffany might never have been discovered if not for trooper Sean Ruane of the New York State Police Department. Early in the morning of June 28th, Ruane was patrolling Long Island's Southern State Parkway when a pickup truck caught his attention. I observed a tan Mazda pickup truck with no license plate on the back. We decided to uh, pull the vehicle over. Instead, the driver took off. But before long, Ruane was going nearly 100 miles per hour, trying to keep up with the truck as it sped through Nassau County. Barreling through stop signs and around corners, the driver seemed willing to do anything to get away. The vehicle actually went up onto two wheels, and uh, I thought it was going to actually roll over. Lucky for him, it landed back on four wheels. After a frantic half-hour pursuit, the driver's luck ran out when he crashed into a street light. I ran up to the, the driver's side of his car, opened the door. He happened to be sitting in the driver's seat with his hands up like this, basically giving up. Um, very kind of uh, casual, actually. As Ruane began inspecting the vehicle, he caught a whiff of something evil, a telltale odor almost every police officer knows. It, it appeared to be the odor of decaying flesh. In the back of the pickup, Ruane discovered a blue tarp and the horrifying secret it concealed. It appeared as if someone was just rolled up in like a blanket. And upon pulling back the tarp, we realized that there was a deceased subject in the car. I was never expecting that. The grisly find was radioed back to headquarters. Then, the suspect's identity was revealed. Right 
34-year-old Joel Rifkin remained oddly calm at the scene, even while he and Ruane were sitting in the patrol car waiting for homicide investigators to arrive. He actually thanked me for turning on the air conditioning and said, uh, you know, thank you for, for turning on the air conditioning because I know where I'm going. Uh, I'm not going to have that. Rifkin was taken to police headquarters in East Farmingdale, where detectives began interrogating him. From the start, he was cooperative. He admitted that he patronized prostitutes uh, quite a bit and that uh, the, the body in his trunk was a prostitute, in fact, that he had patronized and had strangled while having sex with her. The victim was Tiffany Bresciani. Rifkin told investigators he had picked her up on Manhattan's Lower East Side. That was someone I met in the city, and things didn't go well. After killing her, he drove her body to his mother's house and stored it in the garage for three days before trying to dispose of it. Pretty unusual. We uh, never thought that uh, somebody could do something like that. Uh, we've, uh, we've been around decaying bodies before, and it's a pretty uh, disgusting smell. And for him to uh, drive around with it, uh, it just uh, was unbelievable. That wasn't the only unbelievable thing about Rifkin. The detectives were amazed at his icy calm composure. He was uh, very cool, emotionally detached. It appeared that uh, um, he uh, wasn't concerned about this at all. I had a feeling that he had done this before. Under questioning, Rifkin filled in more details about his life. He worked as a landscaper on Long Island, but was unemployed at the time. He lived in his childhood home with his mother and sister. But investigators sensed there was more much more to Joel Rifkin's story. Well, what I thought unusual is that here's a fellow that looks like he could be your next door neighbor, and then go out at night, uh, uh, pick up a girl, and, uh, and strangle her, and kill her, and then dispose of the body, almost like it came like uh, second nature. The detectives followed their hunch and asked Rifkin if there were other victims. I figured, you know, it was, there was no point in being evasive. I gave him the you know, the whole thing. What Rifkin gave was more than anyone imagined. A confession that turned a down and out landscaper from Long Island into the worst serial killer in New York State history. At police headquarters, Joel Rifkin was playing a cat and mouse game with detectives. The 34 year old unemployed gardener just confessed to the murder of Tiffany Bresciani whose body was found in the back of his truck. But investigators believe there was more to the story. Seven hours into the grilling, Rifkin began to crack. They were wearing me down. It was already getting into afternoon. I, you know, I'm tired. I just didn't sleep the night before. They're, they're very good at what they do. They know how to bring it to the edge and then take you back and then bring you back to the edge again. The detectives wanted to know how many other women he had killed. And then he decided to play a numbers game with me. And we asked him, like, how many have you done, 100 or so? And he said, no, I did not do it 100 times. And I came out with more than one less than 20. And going through different numbers, he said 17. He gave us a number 17. Even to such seasoned homicide detectives, the number was a shock. When that came out, that number came out, I was taken aback a little bit. He fed off of that. I think he fed off of Listen, what I've done, I've done 17, and you guys are just catching me now. He offered to draw the skeptical detectives a map showing where he had put two other victims. I think they were very surprised. Finally, just, you know, hand me a map and a couple of pens, and, you know, I'll draw your pictures. So I did. Rifkin's map led police to a remote part of JFK Airport where they found a skeleton beneath a rotting mattress. It was the remains of 25-year-old Iris Sanchez, whom Rifkin murdered on Mother's Day in 1992. This one happened incredibly fast. This was, of all the, all the girls, the fastest. The other body was also where the map indicated, just off the highway in the Hamptons. It belonged to 28-year-old Lauren Marquez, a mother of two from Tennessee. I just basically leaned over her and, and grabbed her neck. We were able to recover these two bodies that had not been discovered before. Uh, so that pretty much put him in the realm of, of, of being believable. Now, with three confirmed bodies to his deadly resume, the detectives understood who they had captured. 
Not just a suspected murderer, but a confessed serial killer. I sensed that he had no remorse, and I don't think he thought of the victims as human beings. I think he thought of them as just as uh, swatting a fly. On that June day in 1993, the interrogation stretched on for 12 hours as Rifkin described each of his 17 murders in gruesome detail. His recollection was, uh, it was very amazing. You can recall all these things from 1989, uh, even all the way to 1993, with each victim, how he killed them, which ones he dismembered, how he disposed of them. Before the day was out, police executed a search warrant at his childhood home. His bedroom was a mess, filled with used dishes, soiled clothes, and discarded magazines. But among the filth, the detectives discovered valuable evidence, hundreds of personal items from his victims. We were overwhelmed, like, how are we going to go through this and go through meticulously? Uh, we started to find identification and jewelry and, and, and different things belonging to girls, uh, underwear, uh, clothing. Rifkin had saved trophies from each woman to help him remember the murders. As the numbers started to increase, an ID would, you know, okay, that has a photo, I know, I know who that girl was, uh, or a piece of jewelry, okay, I know that it's from that girl. So yeah, it would help keep the sequence and, and to remember who was who and remember the events. Those become very important to him. Many times it's an aid in reliving the fantasy. Detectives also found a collection of research material on other serial killers. We found newspaper articles chronicling other serial killers uh, at other times. Jeffrey Dahmer, Arthur Sawcross, different books on the Green River killer. Uh, it, it almost seemed like he was making a study of these type of individuals, fully knowing what he was. Police hauled away hundreds of pieces of evidence, including a saw, a freezer, and a wheelbarrow containing a quart of fresh blood. To help unravel this awful mystery, they turned to his mother and sister, whom Rifkin lived with during his four-year killing spree. I was incredulous that she didn't know, that nobody could know that these things were going on underneath their roof, but how, how well do we really know the people that we live with? As police confirmed each one of his 17 victims, a fuller picture began to emerge. Joel Rifkin wasn't just the most prolific serial killer in New York's history. He was one of the worst of all time, eclipsing such infamous killers as David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, and Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler. As soon as the news got out, this case took a life of its own. After a life spent hiding in the shadows, suddenly the whole world knew who Joel Rifkin was. Why did you do it? Do it. Oh, okay. Okay. Mr. Rifkin, are you responsible for the 17 murders? Mr. Rifkin has uh, spoke of 17 uh, homicides that he uh, committed. On June 30th, 1993, no. New York State Police called a press conference to announce the arrest of serial killer Joel Rifkin. His uh, operation consisted of picking up the woman, having sex with him, killing them and disposing of them. One question above all seemed most important. Do we have a possible motive at this point? No, we don't. What could have caused such a quiet, unassuming man to kill so many women? Mr. Rifkin seemed like uh, he could be your next door neighbor. But at nighttime, he had a, uh, an extreme thirst for using prostitutes. And then uh, he uh, went on a killing spree that made him the most prolific serial killer in New York State history. No one would have dreamed Rifkin was destined for such infamy when he was adopted on Valentine's Day 1959 by Ben and Jean Rifkin. By all accounts, his early childhood was filled with love and support. Started out very loving, very, uh, you know, typical. Uh, my memory is mostly a uh, few years of home movies and a lot of photographs. As we got older, though, and more of our personalities came out, uh, more and more it became my father's little disappointment. Rifkin's father was a standout athlete and math whiz in college who had gone on to become a successful engineer at Brookhaven National Laboratory. He grew impatient with his son, Joel, who had a high IQ of 128, but was plagued with severe dyslexia and coordination problems. 
Like every father, he's very excited about teaching me sports. He tried teaching me how to throw a football, which was his sport in high school. Oh, I couldn't catch the thing. And he just got, after a year or two, he got extremely frustrated. <laughs> and that was that, no more football. Rifkin also had trouble connecting with children his age. By the time he entered school, he was constantly tormented by bullies, often in front of girls. Anybody who wanted to make a reputation as a tough or, you know, one of the local hoods, I was one of the first guys they looked for. And uh, it was rough at times. To escape the abuse, Rifkin became cunning, devising strategies to avoid people. I was one of the last people in the building, which I was almost always late for class, and I was one of the last people to leave the building. If everybody's gone, it's safe to go. Isolated at school and at home, Rifkin retreated to his bedroom, the one place he felt safe. There, behind closed doors, his deviant ideas came to life. I develop, if I'm that type of person, a fantasy life. And I'm in my room or in my private place with this fantasy life where no one attacks me, no one makes fun of me. I'm in charge, I'm in control of that. And if that feels good, I'll continue that fantasy life, I'll elaborate on it. Rifkin's fantasy life began to overpower his hold on reality. After seeing the Alfred Hitchcock movie Frenzy as a teenager, he developed a sexual obsession with strangling women. <laughs> I remember seeing Hitchcock's Frenzy, which I later had a videotape of. It used to always get my attention, that built in the fantasy life. Rifkin graduated from high school in 1977. He stayed at home taking a class at the local community college. One year later, he enrolled at the State University of New York at Brockport, 200 miles away. Before leaving for his first semester, Rifkin decided that he might fit in better if he lost his virginity. I figured, well, I should have at least some experience. I should kind of know something of what this whole thing is. Rifkin headed into Manhattan and picked up a prostitute. She knew I was a kid, basically, so this particular woman was, I would guess, in her 30s. She'd been around. So she basically, you know, played teacher. Rifkin didn't just learn about sex. After years of feeling rejected and humiliated by girls, for just $20, he could be the one in control. The feeling intoxicated him. Self-esteem-wise, you know, as long as you had the, the price of admission, that was it. <laughs> there was no rejection. There was no, you know, you're weird, you're in there, it isn't, none of that. But even with experience, Rifkin was still an outcast at college. After two years, he gave up and moved back home. His father was furious, tired of being disappointed by his underachieving son. Me and my father used to have these horrendous screaming matches over little nothing things. And I was made to feel like the worst kind of son on the planet. In 1986, Ben Rifkin was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Hoping to impress his father for once, Joel enrolled in a biology class at a local university. But just before his midterm grades were released, Rifkin's dad committed suicide by taking a cocktail of barbiturates. Rifkin was devastated, especially since he received a good grade. To this day, I think he timed that cocktail knowing the test was coming. He didn't want to see the, the failure. And I didn't get the chance to, see, to show him that it wasn't a failure. After his father's death, Rifkin sought acceptance the only place he knew he could find it, with prostitutes. When he started a landscaping business in 1989, almost every dollar he earned went into his obsession. That was basically my drug of choice, whether it was the sexual encounter or just hanging out with them. I mean, there were times I'd spent eight hours just driving around in the city. In February 1989, two years to the week after his father's death, Rifkin finally succumbed to his dark fantasies. His mother and sister had gone on vacation, and Joel decided to bring home a prostitute. She was uh, using heroin during that night. She shot up in the bathroom and passed out for two hours. We had sex once, and then she shot up again and passed out again. 
Rifkin, who never used drugs and rarely drank, became irritated with the woman's drug habit. In the morning, still frustrated, he grabbed a howitzer shell that he had in the house and began to hit her. And I just remember picking it up, and the first blow hit her above the eye in the middle of the forehead. And by the time I put it down, I don't know, at least 20 to 30 times I, I struck her with it. Rifkin thought she was dead, but she wasn't. I'm hopping around, and she sits up. And that completely had me freaked out. So we ended up wrestling on the floor. Uh, I got bitten in the process. I still had the scar from that. And probably smothered her more than I strangled her. And that was the first murder. He dragged her body to the basement. Minutes after committing his first murder, Rifkin went back to bed. Four hours, six hours. And woke up, realized that, oh, yeah, I did do it this time. And then had the problem of, how do I get this large item out of the house? Rifkin used an X-Acto knife to cut her body into pieces. And I just decided to make the package smaller. It's easier to take it out in little pieces than to take it out in one big piece. So a little hobby knife and a little effort uh, made six pieces out of her. Once I had everything carved around, I just popped it with force. The hip socket and arm sockets just popped. Rifkin drove around, throwing her body parts out of his car window along various highways. She has still never been identified. Then Rifkin went home and resumed his normal life. I don't remember any rage, any anger, just doing it. That's the odd thing about most of these, these murders, and that I didn't get intensely enraged. They just took place. For the first time in his life, Joel Rifkin was finally good at something. He was good at murder. After the first murder, Joel Rifkin was terrified of getting caught. Whoa, I can't believe I did this, and it was driving down the block. I'm counting the cars. Yeah, that car belongs there, that car belongs there. You know, looking for the odd car, uh, driving past the house, circling back, you know, all this paranoia stuff. But he kept his dark secret to himself and returned to his regular routine of living at home, mowing lawns, and seeing prostitutes. He vowed never to kill again. I really, throughout the, that whole time before the next one happened, was, OK, that's not going to happen again. We're done with that. That was just, and, you know, had a bad day. But he couldn't stop thinking about the murder, especially during sex. For a year and a half, he was able to hold off the urge. Then his mother and sister went away again, and he brought home another prostitute. Her name was Julia Blackbird. There were other girls in that interval also who I'd brought to the house. And they were all still around, as far as I know. Uh, so I don't really know what the particular spark was. They spent the night at his home, then early the next morning drove to an ATM to get money. But Rifkin's checking account was empty, so they headed back home. I needed to wait for the bank to open so they could manually check my balance. So we went back to the house, and we had to kill about an hour and a half. Yeah, good choice of words. <laughs> this time, Rifkin used a table leg. I hit her, knocked her out in one blow, and then strangled her for about 20 minutes, which I was basically strangling her corpse after a while. Rifkin thought about having sex with her dead body something he had read about while researching serial killers. The thought occurred to me because I had heard of it, and then I shook off the thought and said, no. Now I'm making this dividing line in my head. All right, I just killed somebody, but no, I won't go any, f I won't do this next thing. I won't, you know, which is, I don't know, it's odd, but the whole thing is odd. Everyone likes to feel that they're a little bit above the lower uh, portions of society. So I'm not as low as a necrophiliac. I'm just a serial killer. Rifkin dismembered her body in the basement. This time, he sealed the pieces in cement and dumped them in the water. 
And they went into various channels and rivers along New York City. To the best of my knowledge, they haven't found anything. The second victim also hasn't been located. He kept some jewelry, got some jewelry from this victim. Now, a killer for the second time, Rifkin became emboldened. Just four months later, he struck again. The third victim, which we know as Barbara Jacobs, a white female about 32 years old, he picked up Barbara at the 12th Street and 2nd Avenue in New York City. Like the others, he killed Barbara at his home in East Meadow. We had sex in the guest bedroom, and she went to sleep, and I was up and roaming the house. Uh, debated with myself if I really wanted to, to hurt her or kill her, and eventually that impulse was too strong, and I picked something heavy up again, uh, hit her on the side of the head, and strangled her on the floor. Rifkin kept her body in the basement for two days. The body had just begun to change. It looked like it was bloating, so I became afraid to cut it. So I had found a uh, mattress box or some kind of narrow, long box, rectangle. So I slid her into that and dropped it in the Hudson River. Her body was found shortly afterwards, but never identified remaining a Jane Doe until after his arrest. Rifkin didn't care. They were objects. You know, I didn't think of them as having anything else but drug habits and, you know, sex and money. In my mind, they never had families, never had anything. These killers, over and over again, have an abnormal need for power and control. We all like a certain level of power and control, but they have an abnormal need for it. Why? Because it was taken away in their earlier years. So now they're going to react, and now they're going to try to overcompensate for that. Self-employed, with no friends or social life, Rifkin was able to carry on with impunity. His family left him alone and didn't ask questions. Mom was like, hey, as long as he's not moping, <laughs> as long as he's out doing something. His family pretty much were resigned to the fact that the type of person he was, a loner, uh, kept to himself a lot up in his room. He would be out roaming at all hours of the night. That was a normal course for him, as far as the family was concerned. A few of the women actually escaped his death grip, unaware of his fatal intentions. One girl, had, she managed to hook her foot around and lift me up to the roof of the car. And broke contact, and I'm basically dangling like a bug. And I relaxed, she relaxed, and she was like, I got to quit doing this. And of course, you're probably like me. I got to quit doing this. And the next night, she's back out, and I'm back out. The first three murders had occurred with long intervals between them. But his fourth victim, 22-year-old Mary Ellen DeLuca, happened just a few weeks later. Rifkin says he didn't even intend to kill her. We ended up in a hotel room. My thinking was two people walk into a hotel room, two people have to come out of a hotel room. So I was looking for ways to avoid the killing. In the room, DeLuca began to lament about her life. She was saying stories of how she had just come out of rehab, and now she's getting stoned again, and her life is crap, and this has got to stop, and I wish I was dead. And I was like, she didn't have to say much more after that. Rifkin grabbed her throat. We didn't even have any sex. Nice to heck with it. Never even started the sex act, just strangled her. Now he had a problem. He had to get DeLuca's body out of the motel without anyone seeing. Pulled the curtains down, do not disturb on the door, and I went shopping for a, a trunk like a kid takes to summer camp. He got the idea to use a trunk from the same Alfred Hitchcock movie that gave him his first sadistic fantasy. That idea I lifted from Frenzy. The idea worked. Her body, partially decomposed body, was found on uh, October 1st, 1991, adjacent to a rest area in Route 32 in upstate town of Cornwall, New York. Rifkin was not only killing more frequently, he was getting better at it. But he wouldn't get away with it forever. As the body count grew, Joel Rifkin began taking bigger chances. He murdered his fifth victim, 21-year-old Yun Lee, in his truck near the Williamsburg Bridge. I just grabbed her by the neck and didn't let go. 
It was broad daylight. Rifkin propped Yun Lee's body up in the passenger seat and took the expressway back to Long Island. I had to get gas. So I pulled into self-service gas station. They had a body on the front seat. He drove to a work lot where he stored gardening equipment and put her body in the same steamer trunk he had used to hide his previous victim. Then Rifkin returned to the city and dumped the trunk in the Harlem River. Her partially decomposed body was found in the body of water off Randall's Island in New York City. Just days later, he killed again. Victim number six body has never been recovered. He strangled this female uh, who had sandy colored hair. He placed her in the metal drum and he placed his drum in the Harlem River. While disposing of this still unidentified victim, Rifkin was nearly caught by two police officers. I roll the barrel off, splash, turn around, and there's a flashlight. And it's two of New York City's finest. What are you doing? He told the officers he'd been scavenging for car parts. The cops let him go. That was <sighs> the type of thing, yeah. Rifkin went on to kill 11 more women. His murders didn't stand out in a city that was averaging 2,000 homicides a year. The multitude of cases and homicide cases and victims that, that in New York City, a, a jurisdiction like New York City gets, this is just an unfortunate thing sometimes. By the end of 1991, his third year of killing, Rifkin had murdered seven women. In the next year alone, 1992, he killed eight more. I'm not even thinking about it anymore. Some of these other girls, it just didn't take anything. Very almost automatic. All of his victims were strangled. Joe Rifkin is a true sexual sadist. Uh, that thrill that he gets, it gets intermingled in sex. But again, keep in mind that tremendous feeling of power and control he would have strangling a defenseless prostitute. By discarding the bodies over a wide area, Rifkin kept police from connecting the murders. Nobody Rifkin knew suspected anything either. If he met Joel on the street, he, you would think that he was an uh, uh, unassuming guy. I don't think he'd take a second glance at him. Then, in late June 1993, Rifkin picked up his last victim, Tiffany Bresciani, while driving his mother's Toyota. He strangled her in the back seat and drove home. She's naked. I threw some car mats on her. I remember passing a tour bus, deciding it's not a good road. And I remember pulling off, drove to Kmart. Rifkin bought a blue tarp to wrap up Tiffany's body. Now it's around 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, drive home. Mom has some shopping errands to run. And it's her car. So Mom drives off with basically a very odd-shaped package in her trunk. And uh, Mom never used the trunk that morning. After his mother returned, Rifkin moved Tiffany's body to the garage, where he left it for three days. Very hot days, and now it's nice and ripe. Early in the morning of June 28th, Rifkin drove off to dispose of Tiffany's body. But his truck's license plate wasn't properly attached. I heard it fall, and I'm a sloppy mechanic. There's tools everywhere. So I thought I had left a wrench or a socket someplace, and it bounced off. Soon after, Rifkin saw flashing lights in his mirror. Knowing the police would smell the stench from Tiffany's body, he decided to make a break for it and drive into the ocean. I was looking for literally a place to crash. I figured sink the truck, swim, hide under the pier for a while. I don't know what I was thinking. Instead, Rifkin crashed into a light pole after a 30-minute chase. He offered no resistance as trooper Sean Ruain took him into custody. He asked me, he's like, why were you stopping me anyway? At which point in time, I, I advised him that the reason why we stopped him was because there were no license plates on the vehicle. At which point in time, he responded, you know, it's always a 25 cent part. Joel Rifkin's killing spree was finally over. The world was shocked when it learned of his crimes. After being invisible for so long, Rifkin was now in the spotlight. His trial loomed ahead. Soon, he would have to face the families of the women he murdered. My daughter didn't, you know, she didn't deserve to die like that. I'm not guilty. 
Unlike his victims, Joel Rifkin would not have to fight for his life at any of his trials. New York did not have the death penalty at the time. But faced with his own damning confession, Rifkin had few choices when he went on trial for the murder of Tiffany Bresciani in 1994. On the advice of his lawyers, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The insanity defense at that point loomed as the most viable course to pursue if we were going to in some way try to impress upon the jury that Joel truly didn't appreciate the consequences of uh, his actions. Rifkin's attorneys fought to suppress his confession, arguing that it was coerced. Rifkin insists he asked for a lawyer several times during questioning. I asked for an attorney about 20 times, but uh, when it comes to, I guess, a crime this heinous, uh, constitutional rights get forgotten about. It's not unusual after afterwards for the uh, defendants to make all sorts of claims about what they asked for or what the police did or said to them. His confession was ruled admissible. Ten months after Rifkin's arrest, the trial began. The prosecution portrayed Rifkin as a cunning killer who knew exactly what he was doing and went to great lengths to hide his crimes. He was bright enough to be able to pick the type of victims that would uh, not be noticed missing right away, um, to do it, in, to kill these people in areas that would provide him with seclusion and uh, uh, dispose of the bodies in such a way that law enforcement wouldn't be able to put one together with another. They also depicted him as a sexual sadist. He got sexual pleasure not only in killing these young women, but in keeping items from them, their identification cards, uh, items of their clothing, some jewelry, and reliving that pleasurable experience of killing them in the secrecy of his room by uh, holding and looking at all these items that he had stolen from them. As terrible as it is, what more power do you have over someone than life and death when you're strangling them? The defense argued that Rifkin was a paranoid schizophrenic, legally insane, and incapable of comprehending the consequences of his actions. We were claiming that he was laboring under such a pernicious disease that he really wasn't appreciative of what he was doing. Tiffany Bresciani's mother testified at the trial. I knew I had to take a stand not only for, for my daughter, but for all women in the world. The mothers of two other victims were constant fixtures at the courthouse, demanding justice. They wouldn't let me do it. I'll kill him myself. Rifkin's mother was there as well, standing by her adopted son in spite of his gruesome crimes. I didn't know what unconditional love was until my arrest. In the courtroom, Rifkin appeared disinterested, falling asleep several times during the trial. After two weeks, both sides made their closing arguments. The dead, even though disposed of, were dates to Joel Rifkin. His mind never drew the connection between what was real, what was fantasy, what was life, what was death. He knew when he killed Tiffany Bresciani that he was a serial killer. He knew it. He was studying it. He was reading about it. He had articles on Jeffrey Dahmer and Arthur Shawcross and others in his room. And he was doing it to satisfy his own sexual perversions. The case went to the jury. Two hours later, the verdict was in. As to count one, murder in the second degree, what is your verdict? Guilty. At sentencing, the judge gave Rifkin the maximum. You have been found to have knowingly committed the most heinous act one can commit against a fellow human being, the taking of a life. You, Joel Rifkin, are hereby sentenced to an indeterminate term of imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years and a maximum of your natural lifetime. I don't hate him. I don't hate anybody. I just can't understand that. I still, it's still a shock to me. I don't understand it. Over the next two years, he entered guilty pleas to eight more murders. In 1996, when he was sentenced for the murder of Iris Sanchez, Rifkin offered his first apology. What I have done can never be forgiven, but I ask you to believe me when I tell you that I will never understand the part of me that caused me to do these terrible things to your children. Not only will I go to my death reliving these horrors, but I will go there never knowing why he did them at all. You all think that I am nothing but a monster. And you are right. Part of me must be. The judge was unmoved. 
Mr. Rifkin, in case there is such a thing as reincarnation, I want to be sure that you spend your second life in prison also. In all, Joel Rifkin was sentenced to more than 200 years in prison. Today, he has nothing but time to contemplate his crimes. I really didn't get a firm, firmer grasp of what I did until around 9-11 when people were putting posters up looking for loved ones. And that made me realize, yes, there are families and what the families went through. And it changed perspective on a lot of it. Because many serial killers were abused as children, psychiatrists looked there for the source of Rifkin's violent impulses. But with such a normal childhood, Rifkin himself says he doesn't know why he turned into such a monster. They're looking for the cigarette burns, they're looking for the broken bones, and it, it's just not there. And that's one of the, the big mysteries for them and me. I'm not 100% evil, and I'm not 100%, you know, not. You know, it's a mix, unfortunately. After taking antidepressants prescribed by prison doctors, Rifkin says he now sees his crimes in a different light. Now the memories are the reverse of fantasies. Now I wake up. Now, now it's like uh, a kid waking up from a nightmare. They come and I wake up and get something to read to distract myself. But Rifkin also says he can't guarantee if he had the chance that he wouldn't kill again. The honest answer is I don't know. I don't know if I was released, if I'd ever uh, kill again. I might. On the next all new Family Plots. Poor lady was so strong. When one loss brings him down. Told you all about this lady's death for the rest of the day. One life can cheer him up. Chuck took his kitty to a costume party. I think we need a little help. Up against the ropes, baby. An all new Family Plots, Sunday at 9 on A&E.